previously on Solve the World. Hello, Jennifer Dash, he says. My name is Itamar Levi. Uh Huh? I know you, Jennifer says, dumbfounded. I'm, I'm just a witness and a messenger. I don't understand. How did you get here? How how do you know me? Why are you in my bathroom? How how do you know my name, Itamar? I've been hearing about you. Hearing about your story. My... My story? No. That's... That's not right. It's your story I'm following. It's it's your Leviathan. It's a very good story, isn't it? Itamar smiles reassuringly to persuade Jen. Her vugue state remains a cloudy mess. It's a visual puzzle, but there's too many pieces missing. Nothing makes sense. Do you know what's happening to me? You're caught in something of a whirlwind at the moment. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. That's how you know you've made it, right? By the number of names people call you? Episode 74, Brace Yourself. Back when Rabbi Itamar Levi introduced us to Leviathan and her varied mythological backgrounds, the seed of her story came out of the ancient Book of Job. This manuscript, still found today within the confines of the Hebrew Tanakh, tells a classic timeless tale of a man besieged by injustice. The story begins with a good man, Job. We know he is good because the story tells us manifold times that he indeed is. Job is good. Better than you. Better than me. This is important. If we are not convinced of his goodness, the rest of the story offers little insight. Job is good and he is living a good life. He owns lots of land, has a good wife, many sons and daughters, many servants. Despite his consummate wealth, he remains humble. He prays to the God he believes in with frequency, asking God to forgive him of any possible trespass he may have committed recently. And Job goes still further. He prays diligently for his children, asking God to forgive his children of any wrong they may have done, just in case. He is a good man, and he is living life as best as he possibly can. He's the best of us. Who could find fault in him? With this establishing condition in place, the book of Job suddenly pivots. Everything falls apart. All of Job's sons and daughters are killed. His wealth evaporates. He is plagued by horrendous, painful, itchy, scabby boils from head to toe. His wife tells him that the best thing to do is to curse God and die. This is the premise of the book of Job. It is a psalm, a proverb, an allegory, an argument of reality, a lamentation. What does Job try to teach us? What are we to take away? Answer, many things. One of them is this. The world is broken. Say it again until you believe it. The world is broken. And more than this, good people suffer. Bad people often succeed. Wasn't Lilith Babbitt bad? She murdered an innocent orphan boy. Yet she ascended, escaped the brokenness of this world before the onrushing apocalypse. Didn't she? 
The vast majority of the ancient book of Job is a conversation. It starts with Job's three best friends coming to visit him in his mourning. They are good friends. They sit and weep with the despondent protagonist. Yet, inevitably, they seek to find meaning in Job's devastation. They look for answers. Under their worldview, however, there's only one possible solution. You see, they couldn't fathom that the world was broken. Not really. They believed in God, so how could a good God allow these, not just bad things, but horrible, disgusting, abominable, degrading things, to happen to the righteous friend Job? Answer? He wouldn't do that. That was their collective declaration. God wouldn't do this. And so there was only one answer. Job must be guilty. Job is secretly not good. This is the argument that takes most of the book of Job. Job's friends condemn him, and Job cries out to God saying only this, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. If only I could have a trial with God on one side and me on the other, I'd prove my innocence once and for all. The intriguing question is straight in front of us. If Job gets his trial, he on one side, God on the other, then who, in all the world, could stand as judge between the two? Who mediates between God and man? The new reigning Prince of Anmo, one Marshall Winston, found himself in a predicament. Like Job, he needed a trial. A trial at the undisclosed location for harboring orphans through the apocalypse would, perchance, settle down the ravenousness that had developed into the DNA of this post-rebellion society. The problem was simple. The constable had created a dog-eat-dog -dog world of competition. This was unsustainable, and not far from the idea of the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. Work the children. Send the least effective workers to the gas chambers, or rather, in this case, on a train that most now suspected led only to a slow, most likely painful, cold death. That environ bred rebellion so very easily. It didn't take much of a push at all from old Marshall to get it going. The challenge was now making sure this revolution ended more like the American version and less like the French or Russian one. All this anger needed to simmer down, and it needed to do so quickly. The greenhouse was busted in, so the ongoing winter storm that continued to ravage nature outside had a wide open door to come sweeping in. Boarding up the greenhouse was necessary to keep Anmo above freezing. Simply boarding it up wasn't enough, however. Marshall's handiwork in the coal factory alongside Cindy's acid melt to the bike room left little usable energy. They needed heat, and they needed it badly. Not only that, the only close to edible food now was Malandrinian bricks. Which, to be frank, Marshall wasn't entirely sure the body could even break down, digest properly. In any regard, it wasn't a sustainable diet. No food, little warmth, almost no electricity, unusable toilets, banged up kitchen supplies, shredded blankets and sheets, crumbled quadruple decker bunk beds. Everything needed fixing and cleaning. But the children weren't ready to construct. Their brains were still in deconstruction mode. Hence, the trials. Marshall himself lorded over them as chief petty officer and judge. Eight names were chosen, six kids and two adults. These two adults were the only remaining souls above the age 18 left at Anmo sans Marshall himself. The trials worked like this. The suspect was chained to a post. There was no defense attorney. One by one, children came up and accused the suspect of various crimes. Take, for instance, the trial of child Miguel Aquila. Judge, who has a word against the defendant? Several hands raised. The judge points at one hand in particular. The child walks up to the judge, just across from the accused. Judge, state your name. Child one, Kia. Yeah. Judge, Jeff, do you understand that if you lie now about Miguel Aquila, if he is found innocent and you are proven to be a liar, you will stand trial. Do you understand? Child 1. I do. Judge, then you may proceed. Child 1. Miguel kicked adults in the family jewels. Judge, and how did you come to see this? Child 1. I was there. Judge, you were just watching? Child 1. Yes, sir. I mean, no, I was kicking too. Judge, you were kicking the dolt. Child one. Yes, sir. Judge, why then do you accuse Miguel if you are the same as him? Child one. 
I was only kicking the dolt in the back, but I saw Miguel kicking him in the other place. The judge turns his attention to the audience. Judge, does anyone have any information that contradicts Jeff's claims? No one raises their hand. Judge, can anyone confirm Jeff's account? Two children raise their hands. One by one, they too testify. At the end of Miguel Aquila's trial, Marshall asks the congregation for thumbs up, Miguel can go free, or thumbs down. Every trial ended the same way. Thumbs down. Every sentence was the same. Death. Marshall waited to carry out the sentences until all trials were over. He took the six condemned children into his office and told them the following. Look, your peers have condemned you. You deserve to die. But if you play by my rules, then that's not going to happen. I'll let you live. We need peace at Anmo. We also need to fix this place up. Have you looked outside? Hell is freezing over. None of us is going to make it through the winter unless we act together. We have to get the coal plant operational. We have to get the bikes working again. And we need to be peddling those bikes night and day. You six are now my inner circle. If I ask something of you, I expect you to do it. Everyone decided you should die. Don't forget that. Your lives are mine now. So, when I ask everyone to go back to work, you need to lead by example. Work hard. If I catch you slacking off, well then you might just find yourself spending a night outside on most gates. End speech. Marshall was not so merciful on the two convicted dolts. They were sentenced to death by beating. Marshall strapped them to the floor and asked the residents of Anmo to make an end of them. Many children became grown-ups that day. After that, Marshall re-engaged the children to work. Instead of shouting from the rafters, Marshall spoke to small groups at once. He gave specific groups, gangs and cliques, specific tasks. In this way, every group had ownership over a specific task. It wasn't one person fighting for themselves. Now it was everyone for everyone. Marshall was trying his best to make this former survival of the fittest ecosystem into a socialist dynasty. There were hiccups, of course, but for the most part, Marshall's efforts were proving to be a success. The bloodthirst and anti-tyranny powers that be were submerged, dismembered. The children pivoted, no longer wanting to burn the world down. Everything began to go fine. Until it wasn't. Until the day that two new dolts suddenly showed up. After Job argues with his friends for some 30-odd chapters, God himself shows up. His first words to Job are not what anyone expected. They are as follows. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. Jennifer Dash and Atticus Further found themselves within the walls of Anmo. How did they get to Anmo? The Piper sent them. How did they get to Anmo? The Piper sent them. No, really. How did they get there? The Piper. That's all the answer we're going to get. They found themselves in the Hose Corridor. The Hose Corridor stood as a large steel room where large sections of the Malandrinian machine were dismantled and washed with high-powered hoses. A good washing every three days kept the machines clean and free from congestion and possible bacteria growth. If the two some had arrived there at a moment when the machines were actively being screened and washed by children, this story might have taken an even darker turn. Thankfully, they arrived there in a time wherein the room was utterly vacated. Atticus had to give up his cane in order to descend the steep decline to the quiet room in Thailand, so Jen offered an arm around his waist. They walked together as a unit. The hose corridor leads most directly towards one of the boys' cabin chambers. Much of Anmo is separated by adjacent rooms of varying dimensions, connected all by long, skinny hallways. It was in one of these hallways when Jen and Atticus were first spotted. A pudgy eight-year-old, a boy named Bart, was coming from the shower hall, a tower draped around his waist, returning to the cabin to fetch his clothes, 
When he spotted them, his eyes widened. He screamed. Dots! 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 He ran down the room in a panic. Not knowing exactly who to get, he ran directly away from Jen and Atticus. Unfortunately for rather fat Bart, his towel caught the doorknob of one of the rooms. Embarrassed but still frightened out of his wits, Bart covered his front side and continued his screams and sprints, running buck naked down the hallway. Atticus and Jen only ever saw the backside. I guess it's a full moon kind of day, Atticus said. Jen laughed. The comedic moment twisted quickly. Dozens of boys began popping their heads out to see the unwelcome dolts. One boy, a 14-year-old who looked to be as tall as Atticus, maybe taller, strutted down the hall, grimacing at them, something hard in his hand. With a pitcher's extension, the boy flung a rock-hard Malindrinian square towards them. There wasn't time to react. It hit Atticus in his right eye. Down he went like a bullet to the head. Before Jen could react, the boys rushed them. The hallway was cramped. Jen was bullied down to the ground. Atticus, completely limp, was thrown up over the tall boy's shoulders. And, like a roving gang, they carried the unconscious body away from Jen. They left her on the ground. She was alone. Jen had lost Atticus. Just like that. Again. She sat against the wall, trying to calculate what her next move should be. She heard ravaging screams, the ripping of clothes from where they'd taken Atticus. Get up, old girl. She decided to get up, chase them. But before she did, a tap on her shoulder. She turned, flinching, expecting a horde of little man boys to rip her to shreds. It was a three-year-old, maybe four, wearing only a loose diaper. Big brown eyes stared at her, then said, Can you be mommy? Instinctively, Jen pushed herself off the ground and gathered the little one into her arms. Perhaps this little three-year-old boy would protect her. She marched, toddler in arms, down the boy's passageway. She felt a little like Wendy in Neverland, hoping she could civilize a band of misfit, misbehaving infantile boys. More boys kept popping up, but they didn't attack Jen like they attacked Atticus. They just kept touching her. One did it, then, apparently seeing that it was a good idea, another did. Lots and lots of touching. A boy would run up from behind or from the side and swipe at Jen's arm, or the small of her back, or her ankles. They'd touch her, then run away like they just stole something of infinite value. It was a strange thing. Then again, a world of boys without elegant women walking about always turns weird. There was a bigger room up ahead, just a few paces up. Maybe there, Jen could make her case, talk some sense into these mongrels. Maybe they'd listen to her. She could be the den mother if she had to. That thought was strange. Jen had never before pictured herself as a mother. A boy came up from behind Jen, room ball bat in hand. Lights out. Jen awoke to the face of Marshall Winston. Sorry, this is happening, Marshall whispered. I'll get you both out of here, but we gotta get through this. Just get through this moment. Jen tried to move. She couldn't. She was tied upright to a pole. A sock taped over her mouth. In front of her, a raving mash of children. The room they were in was not large, but probably 300 miners huddled themselves in the confines. Thankfully, Jen noticed there were girls amongst the Legion boys. Good. This wasn't Neverland. She wasn't Wendy. And Scout surely was somewhere around. Jen turned her head. Atticus, his face black and blue, stood tied to the pole right beside her. His head slumped over. He hadn't regained consciousness. Marshall stood. The children cheered. What shall we do to these intruders? Kill them! Kill them! Kill them! One kid screamed. Marshall put a finger to his lips. The crowd hushed. No, no. We are not monsters. If we are to kill them, we must first put them on trial. Does anyone have a testimony of accusation? A mumble shivered through the mob. Did these two do anything wrong? Are they villains? A shout from somewhere in the crowd. She's Jen Dash! The crowd upticks and murmurs instantly. It does look like her, doesn't it? Why had it taken them so long to see it? <laughs> Marshall grins. This is not Jennifer Dash. I've seen Jennifer Dash. Met the real thing. 
The real Jen Dash is dead. This person, Marshall looked Jen up and down. Whoever she is, merely looks like the celebrity. She may be a great impersonator, but she's not the real thing. The crowd bought it. Constable Marshall wouldn't lie to them. But when exactly, where exactly, did the constable meet the real Jen? They knew Marshall was a good man, a great leader, but no child of Anmo suspected Marshall of celebrity status. Anything else? Marshall asked. No one responded this time. Anything about the man? A boy spoke up. He attacked me! Come here. State your case. The boy walked up to just beside Jen. The boy surreptitiously touched her fingers, then jerked his hand away. Every boy wanted a touch. How exactly did the man attack you? Jen had never seen this boy before. She didn't recognize him from the crowd earlier. He certainly wasn't the one that threw the brick. I was standing in the hallway, and he came behind me and bit me in the back. Really? Marshall asked skeptically. Uh-huh. I think... I think he's a vampire. A vampire, you say? Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Can anyone confirm this boy's story? No answer. Can anyone rightly deny his words? The room was not all of Anmo, Jen realized. Marshall was in charge of these ones, that was for sure. But that didn't necessarily mean he was in charge of all of Anmo. Wherever Scout was, she might have a different leader. That was good. Jen didn't like the way Marshall was dealing with this. Why didn't he just say they're okay? Why did he lie about who she was? Why didn't he persecute the boy who attacked them? If no one can confirm or deny your story, there's only one way we can validate what you say, young man. You said this dude bit you on the shoulder? Uh-huh. Then show us. Pull your shirt down so we can examine the mark. All right, Jen thought. He's just getting the crowd to simmer. This is how Anmo politics works. Okay, Marshall. Okay. The boy pulled down his shirt. There were deep, bruised teeth marks right across his shoulder. The crowd erupted. Wait! Wait! There's one more thing to be done! Let the accused testify for themselves! Someone get me a bucket of water! A moment later, a girl, no more than seven years old, handed Marshall a metal bucket. He tossed it on Atticus. The water was ice cold. Atticus awoke. His right eye was swollen over. He looked like he'd just gone through three rounds in the ring with Rocky Balboa. Speak! Marshall boomed at the dolt. Uh, huh? What? A foggy Atticus replied. Speak! Tell us! Are you a vampire? Uh, huh? Answer now! Are you a vampire? Jen couldn't stand it. Atticus just woke up. He didn't hear everything that just happened. She threw her body against the ropes and yelled into the sock taped against her mouth. Oh, the lady wishes to speak. Jen's mind raced. Maybe Marshall wasn't who she thought he was. What was he doing here anyway? Why was Marshall Winston in charge of running Anmo? Was Anmo a druidic operation? It dawned on her in an instant. Yes, yes it was. It made all the sense in the world. The druidry made sacrifices. Innocent blood sacrifices. What's more innocent than an orphan? This was a gigantic orphan factory. They were preparing for a giant ritual sacrifice. Just like Lilith. Everyone betrays me. Jen thought. I believed in Lilith Babbitt and she used me to kill an innocent child. I thought Marshall was on my side and now he's doing the same thing as Lilith, only on a grand scale. Marshall pulled off the tape, removed the sock. <laughs> Jen spat at Marshall's face. The children erupted. Marshall put up his hands. No! Stop! Stop! We must see this through with order! Who could possibly stand between Job and God? Who could be the mediator, the intercessor, the advocate? The children would not be stopped. They rushed to the stage. Multiple kids were grabbing at Atticus and Jen's ropes. This was a frenzy. Stop! Stop! I command you! Even Marshall was knocked down. Jen felt the ropes wrenching about and loosening. They were tugging at her. Her shirt ripped. Someone was pulling on her shoe. The other foot, someone was yanking it up. Jen felt her body uneasily raised off the ground. The mob was going to tear them to bits. When God spoke to Job, he answered the mortal from a tornado. 
a great storm. A whirlwind. Loud obnoxious buzzings rang over the room. A voice, scared, but clear as a bell. A voice Jen recognized, but couldn't quite place. The voice over the intercom system rang out. When God showed up in the tornado, this is what he said. Brace yourself like a man. Hey guys, I hope you're doing well. As of the release of this episode, it is still July 2016, so we're still asking for you to maybe consider donating to me. To solve the world, you know, I've given you a service, so if you would like to repay me with some sort of monetary fund <laughs> from our tip jar at DanteStack.com slash T-I-P dash J-A-R, that's DanteStack.com tip dash jar, or just go to DanteStack.com and look for the tip jar button. Click on it and donate via PayPal or electronic debit card. Uh, that would be great. We'd appreciate that. I'd appreciate that. Also, this episode once again featured some music by Richard McGraw. Today we just used the background music to the song Tragedy, which is the first track on Richard McGraw's new album entitled How to Suffer. Uh, if you're interested in Richard McGraw's music... If you're interested in listening to more of Richard McGraw's music, you can stream his entire new album for free at richardmcgraw.bandcamp.com. As for all the other music and sound effects used in this episode, they are appropriately attributed on my show notes page at dantestack.com. Thanks, guys. See you around.